Welcome back to the Messy City Podcast. This is Kevin Klinkenberg. Thanks for joining me. It's been a while since I've uh, had the opportunity to do uh, a solo podcast and just talk about a few things that are going on and, and some thoughts in my mind. And uh, today seemed to work out really well for that and this week. So I'm going to share a few things uh, that are going on and uh, hopefully give you a little, a little bit of uh, inspiration uh, in your day. Uh, if it doesn't inspire you, you can send me a note as as well and say, "Hey, you were uh, you were completely off base there, or lost," and and that's fine too. Uh, of course, I can't help but record these now and think about uh, my friend Chuck Marone's comments uh, about uh, uh, my my own voice and how things sound. I think you know, I think if you do anything like this, uh, you're the kind of person you probably never like the sound of your own voice. Uh, but it's good to know that others respond to it and like it, and uh, I'm happy to keep doing these. Uh, there's a lot going on right now. Uh, there is uh, coming up here in May uh, is the Strong Towns National Gathering, followed by the Congress for the New Urbanism. Uh, it's a big deal uh, in the urbanism world. Uh, those annual confabs, uh, which I have gone to for a number of years, don't know that I'll keep going to those indefinitely, but uh, but I still think there's there's value in that or similar groups like them, uh, depending on what your own interest is. Uh, I'm, I'm also keenly aware that the National Town Builders Association does a couple great uh, get-togethers every year. Those are that tend to be people more on the development side, uh, as well as uh, the Urban Guild, which is a group that I'm uh, a little bit affiliated with as well, which is mostly designers but uh, and, and architects, but it's a lot of people doing really, really cool stuff. Uh, to try to make the world a more beautiful uh, and better place. Uh, they have a get-together coming up this later later this year in November, which will be in Huntsville, uh, Alabama. Uh, and I'm going to try to make it to that as well. Don't know if I can do all these things. It's a challenge when uh, you've got a family and, and work and everything else. But uh, uh, I do always enjoy getting together with colleagues and learning about what other people are doing, figuring out uh, what I can take back to my own community and just getting inspired uh, from other people. So uh, I, I have always uh, enjoyed that. I suppose it appeals to the extroverted uh, na- nature that I have, um, but uh, I certainly enjoy getting that inspiration uh, from others. So I wanted to talk a little bit today about on a different uh, tack. Uh, this, this is not necessarily a new subject locally, but it's something that's been on my mind. Um, and, and bear with me as I go through this, but there, there's a new, uh, there's a new attraction, uh, in Kansas city that opened, um, uh, late last year. Uh, we are among many cities now and that we have a Ferris wheel, uh, (laughs) near the downtown area. Uh, because, uh, you know how these things are, the, all the trends come and go and activities come and go. And, Right now, it seems like every city has to have a Ferris wheel, uh, a big Ferris wheel for people to get up and view uh, the whole city and everything else. And And uh, I've been on it. It's kind of fun. Uh, I, I understand why people like them, and they're visually very distinct and interesting. Uh, the first notable one I can remember that was new, I guess, was in London, uh, which where it was pretty striking. I remember at the time thinking, well, that was kind of strange, but... Now it's uh, gone into the realm of common, uh, and uh, you see these uh, see these attractions popping up just about everywhere. Um, but what what really interested me was the response to the Ferris wheel in the local uh, community and the discussion boards and and everything else. Uh, I, actually, when I say discussion boards, it almost sounds like a, an old man's term uh, at this point, but probably more, I guess, I would say on social media. Uh, which is where a lot of conversation happens. And it's fascinating just how negative the reaction was to me. And I think one of the things that I most commonly heard, where there were two things really, which is why did they put that there? Uh, And why did the city fund that instead of fixing the streets? So uh, all interesting uh, for me, because it, 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 it's all very telling about how people react to um, projects, buildings, structures that are built uh, in a community. And um, I want to talk about that for a minute and what it means uh, for each of us and 
And what I think we, what mindset I think we need to have that is more productive uh, if we want to really uh, improve our own communities. So, you know, I don't, I, I'm not one to ever um, really assail people or blame people for uh, the thoughts that come out of their mouths because, or because this is the world we live in. The world we live in is uh, driven by uh, the experience that people have had over many years. Development in the development world, we've gone to from a place where um, development was almost entirely private sector a hundred years ago uh, to now where there's an enormous amount of public sector uh, development or public private partnerships that happen. Uh, there's an awful lot of things that happen now through government and from the top down that never would have happened a hundred years ago. Uh, and, and I say all that because this, it really came to mind when hearing people talk about the Ferris wheel project. Uh, the first one being, you know, why did the, why did the, why do we have that Ferris wheel when we could have been fixing the potholes? Well, the Ferris wheel in this case, in our city was a private development. Uh, this was an enterprise that a local developer um, bought the land for, came up with the plan, uh, financed it, and built it. This is not a city uh, project. Um, so it's kind of easy for us to, who know that sort of thing, to then just mock people for being stupid, right? You're stupid. How do you not know that that's like a private project? Um, but I get it because – we do have so many things nowadays that are in fact either driven directly by city government, uh, have a partnership with city government or require city government approval uh, to happen. And it's very easy, I think, for an, uh, a layperson who is not in the design development construction world to not understand that uh, and and to think, you know, everything is a, is a city project. But uh, in this case, and probably like many others uh, around the country, this was just a, a local entrepreneur uh, doing a project with land he owned uh, that um, that he expects to make a profit on uh, with this attraction and a whole series of attractions uh, next to it that actually seem kind of cool. And I'm, I'm excited to see how this all builds out uh, over the next year or so as he continues to build it. And, and that really kind of tied into the, the, to the other comment, which is, you know, why did they build it there? Uh, and I admit, I, I want to admit right up front, I have a real pet peeve. Uh, and that pet peeve is the word they. <laughs> uh, and this is something I've had for a long time. Uh, and uh, I, I wrestle with this because I hear it all the time. Which, and it's, it's just this this notion that there is some uh, group of people out there that just make all these decisions for what happens in your community, uh, whether that's uh, city council people or, you know, people in private rooms or whatever. But w we have, we've arrived at this place where we just, you know, all sent, tend to think that there's, there is a they that can be either blamed or praised uh, for whatever goes on. And uh, I, I find that really troubling because it, it's not a they. This was a, a person. Uh, this was a person uh, and his development team uh, that made the decisions and, and built this thing. And that's very common uh, in, in our city. There, I hear this so often, you know, why did, why did they build that apartment complex? Uh, and, um, you know, our city does this and this. Why do they do that? And I think there's this, this thing, there's this thing, this phrase that my wife has taught me from psychology, which is called external locus of control. And the notion being that there are, if you, if you kind of give up control of a lot of things in your own life and decisions, uh, you, you uh, have, have essentially given that control over to others. That's an external locus of control as to an internal locus of control, which is saying, I am responsible for uh, my actions and what happens and what I see and do uh, in my life. An external locus of control means like, eh, you know, uh, I'm just going to let uh, whatever happens, happens. And I think we all balance this in our own lives or we can't possibly control everything. But I also think it's kind of led to this, this symptom where we see where 
uh, we often think there is a they uh, out there that is imposing their will on me or on us. Um, and uh, that's just not, uh, e even in our very complicated world, that's not how it works. But again, I don't necessarily blame people for thinking that, that because we have gotten to this place where there is so much often confusion about who is doing what and who is responsible for what. Uh, there are politicians who, um, even if they didn't do something, they try to take credit for it. That's long been a standard in politics uh, is to deflect the blame and accept, um, you know, accept the compliments uh, for whatever happens. You know, if something is good, name it and claim it, uh, whether you had anything to do with it uh, or not. And I think that gives the impressions that the impression that politicians and um, public sector people often have way more control over what happens in a community than they really do. Uh, and so I, I really wish we could get away from that thinking and that use of the word they, and to really just talk more specifically about who exactly uh, has done something, why, you know, who is that individual uh, that took it upon themselves to create that project and why. Uh, and it's funny because in this case, the Ferris wheel in Kansas City is in a bit of an odd location. Uh, if, you, uh, if you go there, it's right next to a freeway. It does provide a great view of downtown uh, when you're up on the Ferris wheel. Uh, and it's neat before this, in front of the skyline, but it's right next to a freeway, which is a little odd. Uh, and I can imagine a series of other locations in the city where the same thing would have been really cool and, and better. Um, and in fact, there is a major park nearby that is, uh, up on a hill would have been an incredible site for it, but the parks department didn't pursue that route. They didn't try to do a project or this project. And instead you have a developer who did and who took it upon themselves to do it. And that was the place, uh, where he had the opportunity to make it work. And, and I hope. Uh, I really hope it works. I think it will work. I think it's going to be a, a cool attraction and sort of entertainment area for the city. But uh, that's how those things go. And I, I want to, I just want to encourage all of us to kind of get beyond this notion that there is uh, a they out there. And and one thing that I, I, I would just add to this is that, um, you know, it kind of feeds into a, a, a mindset uh I think when you, when, I think when you approach something like they are doing something to me, uh, or they are doing this, they are doing that. It, it can kind of feed into a, a real negative feedback loop, um, that can be a real trap, uh, for people, uh, in a community because there are always, there's always something going on. Uh, there are things to not like and things to like, uh, and, um, and I think that you know, every community, every society has problems and, uh, and, and we want to try to solve problems. Uh, and, and we're at a time and a place where I think a lot of our cities do have problems and, and, uh, I, I would never be the first to say otherwise. We have a lot of issues and things to resolve. Um, I mean, in my opinion, the worst of our problems tend to come from kind of a utopian thinking, uh, coupled with the desire to, to force utopian ideas uh, from the top down uh, on people who maybe uh, aren't ready for it and, and are often very bad ideas. Um, but that said, I, I, I really hope that we can kind of find a way to avoid the forces and the voices of negativity. And I think that, uh, that use of the word they uh, – almost always leads to like a negative mindset and a negative commentary. And again, as the idea that your locus of control is outside you for your community uh, and for your neighborhood, uh, as opposed to thinking about ways that you and others can take control yourselves and just do things and do positive things uh, for your place. Um, so one of the things that I would just say is, you know, try not to give in to the voices of negativity, doom and gloom, and grievance. Um, it, sometimes it seems to me as if it, it's as if we have a grievance industrial complex uh, in our country that um, there are people who have so many grievances about life or society that they move from issue to issue 
and they carry with them the same anger, um, the, the same uh, sort of negative vibes, no matter what the concern or topic is. Um, and that's problematic. It's not, it's problematic for the person, uh, I would say. Um, I, I once, once heard uh, a quote, um, uh, I can't remember who said it, but it was something to the effect of bitterness is a poison that you think you can use it against your enemies, but ultimately it ends up destroying you. Uh, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. There have been things in my life that I have been bitter about, uh, and I have wrestled with, uh, internally and I have had to learn, uh, that that bitterness that I might've been holding on to was actually causing me physical harm. Uh, and that physical harm might've been something minor, like just like loss of sleep, uh, and loss of sleep turning into negative moods or whatever. But it also might be something more that you get so consumed by negative thoughts that it's very hard for you to do anything constructive in your life or, uh, to be, uh, to, to be somebody that others want to be around, uh, and to do good things with. Uh, and, and so I would, uh, I would just humbly suggest that as much as you could, especially if you're a younger person, uh, embrace a positive vision for the future. And, um, there, there's a, there's a very popular, uh, sort of meme going around lately. That's just about, we need to be building things. We need to build more things. And I think that's true. I think we're in, I think we're kind of coming, I, I hope we're coming out of an era where there's a lot of vitriol and, uh, negativity, which presents an incredible opportunity for people who have a positive vision, vision of what the future could be and what to do about it. Uh, and, to actually build, build yourself up, to build others up around you, um, to build things physically. So obviously a lot of what I talk about on this podcast is about designing, building, developing things. And I think there's unbelievable opportunity for anybody in any walk of life to get into a place where you're actually participating in building something physical, which is an, in, there are just immense emotional rewards for seeing that happen. Um, so as somebody who was trained as an architect, I obviously love that very much. Um, but I think for anybody that I see, whatever it is, the more you can create things and build things physically, uh, is, is incredibly, um, just valuable to yourself, uh, as well as people beyond you. Um, right now we have, or in, even I would say the last decade, there have been so many, uh, very, very loud voices that seem to push the other way and think we shouldn't be building things. And that uh, I would just say specific to the world that I know uh, the best, that like developers are evil and they're awful and they're money grubbing people. And we, we need to, you know, take our pound of flesh as much as we can and punish them. Uh, and, uh, there's just an awful lot of vitriol and, and hatred of developers and of development, uh, that, um, that is, uh, in the end, it kind of reflects that problem with bitterness because, um, people are going to build things. And if you, uh, if you and your community embrace an attitude that developers and development is bad, you are creating a recipe for your own decline ultimately just in the same way that carrying uh, bitterness from something that happened years ago can really lead to just personal harm. Carrying bitterness towards change for the future uh, is only going to make your place less and less relevant uh, and uh, less attractive to others who want to have a positive future. So that doesn't mean, of course, I, and I feel like I always have to qualify this and say it, that like, that doesn't mean all development is great and all, you know, and I love all of it. Uh, there's a lot of terrible development. There's a lot of, there's a lot of bad architects. There's a lot of bad developers. There's bad buildings that are built. We should always try to and strive to do as good a job as we possibly can to try to build beauty in our world. I'm, I'm a firm believer in that building beauty is 
so deeply important. It's for the human spirit and for life in communities. Uh, and we don't talk nearly enough about building beautiful things, building beautiful places. Uh, even, e- even if you're not in the building world, you know, something as simple as planting a flower garden that adds beauty to the world uh, is incredible. It's so important. And, uh, and I wish we, we all could do a little bit more of that. So of course do good things, but you have to have this attitude of improvement and positivity and that activity in the world is a good thing. And that a utopian aim, uh, while maybe it comes from a good place is something to be deeply concerned about, especially when somebody is pushing their utopian aim, uh, on somebody else. Um, so build yourself up, build others up around you, challenge yourself to get better all the time. This is kind of a funny sidebar, but, uh, I've definitely, um, read, you know, my share probably of like self-help stuff, uh, in my life just, um, because, uh, I think, uh, I think I'm probably the kind of person that's always looking for ways to just improve what I'm, whatever I'm doing, maybe optimize, uh, a little bit. Um, but, uh, I, I, I do, I have at different points in my life challenged myself to do things that were, um, uncomfortable that I was not good at, that I, um, didn't really have in my background, uh, and, and often did that just as a way to force myself, uh, to do something that maybe was uncomfortable. Uh, I am by no means, you know, like, uh, some of the more intense, really optimizers and, uh, everything else in the world. But, uh, you know, for example, when, um, when, when I was a kid, I was a very unhealthy, a very sickly kid. I had asthma that was, uh, that was really, it was actually life threatening for me as a, as a child. And, um, I, I eventually with, uh, with time, with some medication and with growth, uh, basically outgrew it. Um, but I didn't r- really start to fully outgrow it until I was like, uh, almost out of like high school, I would say. And, and, uh, and, so there was a lot of like athletic stuff that I just wasn't really able to fully participate in when, when I was a young person, uh, because I just didn't have the stamina, the long stamina to get through things. So when I got older, when I turned 40, uh, I resolved that I wanted to, I had started to do a little bit of long distance running and I resolved that I wanted to run a half marathon. Uh, which of course I had never run <laughs> any distance anywhere close to it uh, before, uh, and uh, I I actually completed my first half marathon when I was 41, and I did it three years in a row, uh, and actually each year improved my time from the year before, um, and all of that was a tremendous physical challenge for me to do because I had never been a long distance runner. Um, but I will tell you the feeling that I got from that when I would complete those races and the memory that was still with me about uh, how challenging it was just for me to breathe when I was a kid, the fact that I could overcome and do those things, it meant a lot to me. And it gave me uh, a lot of uh, confidence and uh, the feeling that if I could do that, I could do other things uh, as well. Um, lately I've been doing something similar and I, I don't like to talk too much here about just personal things that are going on. But, uh, now that I'm into my fifties, um, I have been trying some things that have also been challenging for me. And so I've been doing some martial arts stuff the last couple of years. And this year I've actually started, uh, doing, uh, jujitsu classes, uh, in, in earnest for the first time. And, uh, that has not been my world at all. I mean, I, and I, when I go to these classes and uh, I take a beating and it's hard and, uh, it, you know, you, you learn all the things that are going on. Uh, you know, this is not the world that I came from where of, you know, wrestling and com- combatives and, and that sort of thing. Um, but I have really learned to enjoy it. And uh, especially with the jujitsu training, uh, the more I go, the more I just really get into it and enjoy what I'm learning and the feeling that I get of it making me stronger and more capable 
uh, and the fact that, you know, that it's hard, uh, that, and it is really hard that I, that it's hard, but I can get through a class. And even if it's, you know, a rough day or whatever, uh, afterwards, I have this feeling that I really did something. Uh, and, and so I share that again, just to say that it's, it's important to challenge ourselves to, to do better, to try to, you know, sometimes maybe to push on things in your own personality, uh, and your own world that, you know, aren't that you struggle with or that are not your thing. And I'm a firm believer in trying to push through some of your weaknesses whenever you can and, and challenge yourselves and have that, that vision that yes, I can overcome things. I can do things. Uh, and, and embrace, uh, a vision that you are capable, uh, of doing a lot of things. So, um, you know, being, I understand why a lot of people are very risk averse and you kind of get in a lane and you just stay in that lane, uh, in, in your life. Um, but being too risk averse can really prevent incredible self-improvement and, and you can miss out on a lot of successes uh, in life that you probably never knew that you were even capable of. That's not to say like be reckless and just take any risk you want. Um, of course not, but, but don't be fearful either. Uh, and, uh, really lean towards, um, this notion of building yourself up and then building others up along the way, because the more you build yourself up, you will find that people are drawn to that. People want positive things to cling on to and to, um, and to take, take, you know, to take themselves, uh, along for a ride for something that's good and interesting and positive. People like to build things. And I, and I often think that some, I often think that we don't talk enough about how people, uh, like to overcome difficulty. Uh, and so difficulty in and of itself is not a bad thing. I think it's a really, it can often be a really good thing. Uh, and so push through that difficulty, uh, as, uh, as Bono might say, uh, don't let the bastards grind you down. Right. Um, so that, that's where a few thoughts uh, for today. I, you know, I think one, one last thing, I, I have no idea where this is going to go, but in, in the spirit of, again, pushing through and trying to do things. Um, you know, I have pers- had a personal interest in real estate development since I was a college kid. Uh, and, um, maybe even younger, I don't know. It's hard to remember at this point, but, um, but there were so many steps along the way where I could have taken a risk to do something. And I took a few, but I, I just never really fully dived into that to see what I was capable of. Uh, and, uh, I think, what for me is that that lesson is you tend to regret the things you didn't do more than the things that you did do. And I certainly regret that when I was uh, younger, I didn't take more risks and more proactive steps to push through uh, my lack of knowledge, uh, my own uh, questions about risk uh, when it came to maybe developing some of my own um, building projects. So this week, um, I actually put in an offer on a commercial property for the first time uh, that I have ever done. I've never done this before. Sent a letter of intent over uh, to purchase something. I don't know if anything will come of it. I hope something will come of it. I have a great idea for a project uh, on the site. Uh, it's not a terribly large project. I think it's kind of uh, in a wheelhouse that I can execute uh, really well, a uh, fairly small project. But uh I'm challenging myself to, to push through, uh, my own, um, aversion to just taking that next step and, uh, and we'll see what happens. So hopefully something, uh, comes of it and I'll be able to share some details as it goes. Uh, and if not, there will probably be another opportunity right around the corner. And, uh, that's the message that I, I would hope to share is there's always opportunity around the corner. Don't think so much about who they are and what they are doing and think so much about you and what you are doing, what you can do, what you and your friends or others or your family can do, uh, and have that internal locus of control and, and don't imagine that the world does everything to you, um, 
create your own world in the process. Thanks so much for listening. If you wouldn't mind sharing the podcast, hitting the like or follow button on your favorite app and encouraging others to do the same, I'd really appreciate it. This is Kevin Klinkenberg. This is the Messy City Podcast. We'll be talking to you soon. Bye.